Drakthir then. Okay, you bring all the powers of the dragon flights together, you add in a bit of mortal special sauce, and, uh, well, you're pretty much there. Kind of came out of left field for a lot of people, but as you're going to discover today, it's actually a thing black dragons have done for a long time, and it's pretty powerful. Kind of dragon soul powerful, which actually does bring up some big old lore questions. I mean, what is the ancient war that these Drakthir were created to fight in? That's a good question. Should we be worried that they've woken up? Kind of signifies maybe that war is going to happen. And just how do they fit into the game's lore? Because they're not as strange as you think. Because between Nefarian and his chromatic experiments, Sinestra and her Twilights, and just about every other time that a dragon has been changed with magic in the setting, uh, they actually totally fit in. That's exactly what we're going to work out today. So join us as we figure out what crazy schemes the Black Dragons have been up to. Uh, the thing is, though, you wouldn't really know about them because they actually don't have squarespace.com forward slash Bellular Gaming, who are, of course, today's sponsor. And the Black Dragons, I mean, come on, you got to work in your PR. A short while ago, I added the media section to our studio's website. It was that easy. It was super fast. People have been clamoring for some more music from our game, and with Squarespace's easy-to-use tools, doing this took, like, five minutes, maybe less. I headed to the media page that I made last time, I created an audio block, I dropped the music in, and uh, the SoundCloud integration's dead easy, and just voila, it worked. And with a flip of the switch, the page is live. And that means you can check out those never-before-heard tracks now. All easily, and thanks to Squarespace, who of course do a hell of a lot more. Memberships, email lists, e-commerce, and loads of other fantastic features. I mean, last time I gave the e-commerce a whirl to see how it would work, it was super easy. And now that I know they can hook into the fulfillment center that we use, I know that eventually when I make moves there, it'll be automated and it'll work real smooth. Pretty awesome. So you can get started with Squarespace's award-winning website templates today and build your own presence on the web at squarespace.com forward slash Bellular Gaming with that code Bellular Gaming for 10% off. Thanks to Squarespace. Let's go. The Drakthir and Evoker go hand in hand. In interviews, Ian told us that they thought about a few different class combos, but basically when the lore of the Drakthir came together, their class ended up becoming self-evident. So, we have a starting point for both this new race and class, Neltharion. But we're not talking, not talking today about the big Deathwing that terrorized Azeroth for 10,000 years or anything like that. Because to understand the Drakthir, we need to understand the mind of an uncorrupted Neltharion. Who was he? What was he like? Well, Neltharion was a savage and cunning proto-drake. He had a deep sense of honor, and he was closest to Malagos in terms of friendship, respecting Malagos's intelligence. Even as a proto-drake, Neltharion would absently stare at mountains, almost as if he was listening to whispers from the deep, a sign of what eventually would be his future corruption. After his empowerment, up to being an aspect, Naltharion was given the Hammer of Kazgaroth, and imbued within that was the power to shape mountains and waterways to benefit the fledgling mortal races and help defend the Earth. He was considered to be the most wise and benevolent of the dragons, the Earth Warder. That is the mind, that's the guy that creates the Drakthir. Wise, benevolent. You might ask, if he's so benevolent, why is he building an army? Of course, you need an army for one thing, and that is war. So as you know, the Proto-Drakes were infused with all this order magic from the Titans, and they were uplifted, right? Up to being the dragons that we know. Now, they were all the dragons, the Proto-Drakes, they were kind of offered the same deal, essentially, and many of them did join. But some believed that being uplifted and serving this purpose, it was basically servitude with another name. They thought that instead of accepting all this order magic and titan business, they should go back to the primal source, the elements. For we know that the dragons somehow actually do descend from the elements. And of course, the elements are of Azeroth herself. This was a more philosophical division at first with the dragons, but then the conflict escalated. We don't actually have the timeline to this, but we do know that two very important things happened. Number one, the primalists began essentially worshipping Galakrond, or really believing in him. 
Uh, this was a departure from most of what we'd heard about Galakron before. So depending on Dawn of uh, Aspects being holy canon, Galakron was an absolute monster. Not just like a massive proto-drake, but also whatever corruption that took him wanted to destroy Azeroth. It's really quite strange. So we kind of have to wonder, do the primals want the same thing? Or is there perhaps a dimension to Galakrond that we're unaware of? And maybe that's one of the things Blizzard is actually excited to tackle in this expansion. But either way, the primalists had something powerful enough to challenge this sort of force of the titans. Second, then... The most powerful primals were infused with elemental energy, becoming the primal incarnates. Now, this is a huge escalation in this war because the primals now actually had something powerful enough to challenge the aspects themselves. And indeed, these primal incarnates are the first raid tier of this expansion. Now, way back in the time of this deep history, the elemental lords, they were actually under the old gods' influence. So I suppose we could be looking at an incredibly old Order versus Void conflict, but I have to imagine far more told through the lens of the people who actually are involved in this deep history, and of course in a time where the old gods are significantly, they're essentially inactive in Azeroth. Anyway, at some point in this conflict, obviously reached the boiling point. Naltharion had a plan with all of this. So whilst he was doing all of his, you know, Naltharion Earth Warder things, he kind of noticed this, like, mortal strength, and he came to respect it. Now, at the time, you've got the Kaldori Empire dominating Azeroth, but, of course, you've also got the Trolls, the Yangul. A uh, very cool legend even tells us that they were, of course, infected with the Curse of Flesh 15,000 years ago, and that means perhaps there's even this, a slight chance there's a few humans knocking about. So, Naltharion basically wanted the resilience of these mortals. That special sauce the mortals just seem to have, but with the magic of dragons, and not just one type. They would have the power of every dragonflight. So, the perfect weapon in a war against these primals. Now, we've got no idea of what happened in this war. But considering that the primal incarnates are in prison, and that prison is our first raid, I think we can guess the outcome, and that they lost. So that's their origin. That's the origin of the Drakthir. They seemingly were made for this conflict, but they were never unleashed. Where did we get this lore from? What did Ian mean when he said that the Evoker naturally came from Drakthir lore? Well, time to work that out. So the Drakthir bring together the power of life, you know, the Emerald Dream, uh, arcane, time, all the power of the planet itself, just the stuff from all five aspects. Super powerful. Some people are maybe questioning, maybe people who remember the character Madan, uh, maybe thinking too powerful. Well, they're probably toned down a lot. So the Drakthir may have been the first time that these powers were actually combined. But they weren't the last, and what Deathwing, or Maltharian, learned from this almost certainly feeds into one of the most crucial artifacts in Warcraft's history. So, at some point after this war with the Primal Incarnates, but before the War of the Ancients, the voices in Neltharion's head started to get louder. Now, he began to just feel suffocated by his responsibility, you know, his responsibility to the whole planet, and he went insane. The voices gave him a plan to stop that pain, to create this special golden disc, and to invest within it the power of, that's right, all five Dragonflights. That's the Dragon Soul. Evidently, what he learned making the Drakthir was then applied to the Dragon Soul. So when Altharion approached the other aspects uh, with the plan for the Dragon Soul, they really must have trusted him in general. Now the thing is, they actually canonically did not know about the Drakthir. So while the Drakthir were created to deal with whatever war, evidently the Primal Incarnates get imprisoned and then the Drakthir are not needed. Of course, until in this expansion, the power of the elements and all that comes back to the Isles, and they leave their hibernation. So anyway, the dragon aspects invested a portion of their power permanently into the disc, the dragon soul. But buried at the heart of the dragon soul, of course, was old god corruption. Then, when the War of the Ancients broke out, Meltharion saw the perfect opportunity to release the power of this artifact, and he tried to dominate the other aspects. Malfurion, Crassus, Broxgar, the very cool time-hopping orc, they stole the demon soul from Neltharion, 
But just to illustrate the power of this device, it was then used as the key artifact in the ritual that sundered Azeroth. The dragon soul then fades a bit into obscurity, but even 10,000 years later, it was powerful enough to dominate Alex Trasa. So the evoker is basically this very same power, but humongously scaled down. Also, without void corruption. At least that we know of. Perhaps the Dracthiel will learn a secret about themselves. Anyway, combining all of that power must have seemed like a great idea, because the Black Dragons just kept on trying it. Turns out, they're actually a pretty smart, if unhinged, bunch. Experimenting in Dragon Eggs was the Black Dragon's plan to basically take over the world. Their super weapons project, their secret plan. That's exactly what Nefarian wanted. Of course, Nefarian was one of Neltharian, aka Deathwing's, strongest children, and he shared his father's cunning mind. You see, the Drakthir are one thing, but imagine combining the power of all flights into a fully-fledged dragon, not some sort of little mortal dragonlet. The result could potentially wipe out every single other flight. After the Second War, Nefarian moves in to Black Rock Spire. He then orchestrates a secret campaign of stealing eggs from all the other dragon flights, and then he performs torturous experiments, pumping them full uh, with the energy of the other dragon flights. Now, these experiments were largely failures, but there's one chromatic dragon, Glyph, who was created. Now, even if Nefaria never got to see the perfect end goal of his experiments, his hard work did eventually pay off. The Twilight's Hammer Clan, Cult, they kicked the project back into action, creating the ultimate experiment, Chromatus. Five-headed, one head from each flight. It took all five aspects and Thrall summoning in the elements to bring this monstrosity down. But his body was literally indestructible and now there is a prophecy that he one day will return to destroy all the dragons. That's pretty big and pretty bad, and even if it's still just appearing in a book, it's certainly one thing that is on our radar for uh, an enemy in Dragonflight. However, perhaps, after some discussions with the team, I'm thinking that because there are just some, let's just say Alex Trez has put in a very iffy situation in that book, and that makes me have a feeling, especially in light of more recent events, the Blizzard will want to sort of stray away from that territory. So who knows if Chromatis will actually end up being in the game. But what makes us think of some chromatic dragon stuff is, of course, that uh, we do see one of them alongside, uh, of course, also seeing resurgent black dragons in BFA. And all that just kind of points to the sorts of enemies that are becoming active in Azeroth and that we may indeed face on the Isles. Messing with dragon magic is probably easier than we think, because it keeps on happening. Uh, during the Second War, Deathwing brought a whole bunch of black dragon eggs to Draenor. The plan was to set up shop and, of course, to slowly take over the planet. If you've been to the Blade's Edge Mountains, you'll have seen how that went. But some eggs did actually survive, and when the planet was shattered by Ner'zhul, they actually got infused with the power of Nether, becoming one of the things that I think was the most inspiring in the game to young players like me, the Netherwing Flight who, of course, were a major rep in TVC. And that should show you how dragons work. If you blast enough magic at their eggs, they just fundamentally change. That's true of nearly everything in Azeroth, really. Humans, dwarves, gnomes, or order, you know, being influenced by the Void's uh, curse of flesh. Trolls becoming elves through the Well of Eternity. But the dragons just seem to be hyper-affected by it. Just look at all the flights and all the different variations and all the mad, wacky science experiments that have been pulled off. And that brings me to Syntharia, Neltharian's prime consort, who realized this incredible potential. And then, with her characteristic black dragon cunning, she experimented on the Netherwing eggs to create the Twilight Dragonflight. 
And that's just where, of course, the natural cunning that uh, went into the Drakthir is seen, but of course filtered through this kind of void, twisted mind with Syntharia, who, as we pointed out in this video about dragons, that, I mean, seriously, it's, it's a really awesome video, um, but like eight people watched it. So definitely check it out if you're interested in learning all the things that you, you really should know as you go into this expansion. They'll make it more fun for you. Um, yeah, there's her stories there, as are a bunch of others. Man, the dragon stories are really cool. But the thing is, all this spooky evil stuff, you know, chromatic dragons and twilight dragons, that's not the Drakthir. The Drakthir are kind of like the power of the dragon soul in a way, bringing all five together. Uh, the experiments of the chromatic dragons and the twisted genius of the twilights, those are different. They're all black dragon cunning, but from a time where the black dragons are, are evil, whereas the Drakthir are black dragon cunning and wisdom and all of that but from a time when the black dragons were actually the good guys. We've seen all these evil dragon experiments. Now we get to play as a good dragon experiment. But the reason why this general setup with the lore is actually quite engaging and interesting to me is I know that their first zone, their starting zone, is set up to be a bit of a mystery. And it's a zone that will return to at max level. I think there's a lot of story, uh, storytelling potential here. I think the idea of being created for a purpose but then actually having your own personhood working out who you are in the world what you think about things i actually think that's a really awesome setup for a playable race in a video game i mean it's just so different to being joe the human right so i think it's really cool i'm pretty damn interested in them and because of the super tight integration of class and spec while that are class and race while that does obviously have downsides that we all know about i think there's also some pretty cool upsides and just how like visceral they could feel. So tell you what, touch wood, it will be good, of course, but I'm pretty excited. And I hope today I've explained some of the lore that makes them make sense. Maybe you just more appreciate the sorts of draconic things that are going on. So that's it for today's video. I hope you found it uh, interesting, enlightening, or maybe even entertaining. And of course, a massive thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. They have been really a supporter of the channel for such a long time. I use their tools, they save me a hell of a lot of time and time is a really really valuable thing so knowing that i can very easily do web things when i need to is uh, honestly just a load off my mind so if you want some of that yourself you can check out squarespace with my link down below so thanks to them thanks to you for watching and i'll see you next time